quantitative microbial risk assessment to manage food safety risks, presented by Dr. Donald W. Schaffner from Rogers University. Now, just before I introduce Dr. Um, Schaffner, please remember to mute your microphone during the presentation, and if you have questions along it, uh, you can write them down on the chat so that, so that you don't forget them at the, at the end. And you can ask them directly to or speak it in the portion um, that we have for questions and answers, or I can read them aloud for you. Okay, a little bit of an introduction. Dr. Donald W. Schaffner is an extension specialist in food science and a distinguished professor at Rutgers University. He has authored more than 150 peer-reviewed publications and educated thousands of food industry professionals through short courses and workshops in the United States and around the world. He is a fellow of the Institute of Food Technologies and the American Academy of Microbiology. He has served as an editor for the, for, for the Journal of Applied Environmental Microbiology since 2005. Dr. Schaffner was the president of the International Association for Food Protection in 2013 and the 2000, between the 2013 and 2014. And he spared time as, um, in his spare time, he co-hosts an, a food safety podcast at foodsafetytalk.com. So without further delay, let's um, give the microphone to Dr. Schaffner. Thank you, Veronica. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I really, really appreciate um, ISFE um, inviting me uh, to, to present to you folks here today. So um, I have um, uh, not too many slides, um, uh, but uh, I do have uh, uh, a bunch that I want to get to. Hopefully, I will stimulate you um, to ask some questions, and uh, we can have a good discussion about quantitative microbial risk assessment. So let's get started. Um, before I launch into the, the details of my presentation, I want to put uh, quantitative risk assessment in the context of risk analysis. Uh, and this is uh, this is kind of the the conventional view of how risk assessment fits into into risk analysis. So risk analysis is typically thought of as having three components. One is risk assessment, one is risk communication, and then the third is risk management. And what I'm going to focus on for purposes of my talk here today is risk assessment, the first bullet point. In risk assessment, we we ask questions like how big is the risk? and what factors control that risk. And risk assessment is, by and large, a scientific process. It's undertaken by scientists. It uses scientific information. Um, it uses mathematics and statistics to combine uh, that, that scientific information to come up with and um, typically, I mean, we all we all do risk assessments all the time. Uh, the decision <clears throat> about whether to go through a yellow light uh, or to, uh, to to cross in the middle of a busy street, um, uh, even the decision about whether uh, to take an umbrella uh, to work or not, or take an umbrella with you uh, when you go for a walk, um, all of those are forms of risk assessment. But what I'm talking about here is something a little bit more specific. I'm I'm talking about something called quantitative risk assessment, and this as you might gather from the name, deals with numbers. And since we're talking about quantitative risk assessment in the context of food safety, we're going to be talking about foodborne disease, that is microorganisms that cause uh, human illness and the fact I'm not going to talk too much about the second bullet point, which is risk communication. Risk communication deals with talking about risk with affected individuals. So in a way, um, you can think of my entire, my entire presentation as being risk communication, because I'm communicating with you about risk. Um, but, it's, but, but certainly, I don't consider myself a risk communication expert. Um, there are people out there who have uh, degrees in the social sciences and in psychology who, who do um, uh, deal with this as a research topic, um, but that's not the, the focus of our uh, conversation here today. 
The third component is something called risk management. Risk management deals with what do we do about the risk. Risk management, and this is this is a very key point. Um, it's I'm gonna. There are a couple of places in my in my remarks here um, uh, that I want to specifically underline, and this is this is a very important one. Um, <clears throat> risk management is not. I repeat, is not a scientific process. Risk management deals with what do we do about the risk. It's a societal process. It's practical, and it's a. You can think of it as a political process, but that's a P with a, uh, a political with a small P, um, uh, not related to political parties. But it's basically a, a process by um, by which risk managers, people who are charged with managing a risk decide what to do about it. And in risk management, risk managers will deal with uh, not only what does the risk assessment say, but what do we do about it in a way that's practical and that's achievable. Um, and, and again, I'll give you uh, maybe some more examples to highlight what I mean by risk management in the context of my, of my remarks. Give me a second here to. Um, uh, okay, <clears throat> so in my uh, presentation for you here today, I'm going to give you two examples, um, and these are both examples uh, that I'm familiar with. Um, the first one uh, was a an unpublished consulting assignment that I did, uh, focusing on uh, trying to help a candy company decide what to do. Um, about uh, a particular batch of candy that they had produced that was made with a contaminated ingredient. And specifically, they wanted to answer the question, do we need to do a recall? And again, I'll get into the specifics of, of that example in just a little bit. And then in the remaining time uh, that I have, I'm going to talk about a different risk assessment. Uh, this was a, a quantitative microbial risk assessment that was done for leafy greens. Uh, specifically for spinach, and this um, uh, was published in the peer-reviewed literature. It was published in the Journal of Food Protection, and what we tried to do here was through the through through carrying out this process, through writing this paper, we tried to simulate an outbreak that happened um, uh, in uh, the mid 2000s uh, with some spinach that was uh, uh, grown in California that ended up causing a very, very large food poisoning outbreak. And we wanted to try to uh, essentially reproduce that outbreak um, using some assumptions and using some, some tools on the computer. And so I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, that's a more complicated risk assessment, and I don't have time to go into the full details, but of course you can get a copy of the peer-reviewed publication um, uh, from your local library or on the Internet <clears throat> um, 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 or, or, or from me if you, if you need to as well. Okay. So let's focus on this peanut uh, risk assessment to start with. Uh, this, uh, <clears throat> again, as I said, I was contacted by a candy company that had the misfortune to purchase peanut paste from a company called the Peanut Corporation of America. And I don't know how much you know about the Peanut Corporation of America. Um, they are out of business. Um, uh, uh, the principal of the company is in jail. Um, they, uh, as I try to explain to my friends and family that are, don't work in the food industry, 99.9 .9 or more percent of the people in the food industry are good people and they try to do the right thing. And then there's people like those guys from the Peanut Corporation of America. These were some really bad actors. They sold a lot of contaminated peanuts to a lot of people, including this candy company. And this particular candy company, um, uh, actually, so this, this happened uh, a number of years ago, right about this time of year. And, and this, um, this candy company was uh, faced with potentially having to do a recall right before Valentine's Day. And so what this company does is all year long they make candy, and then they sell most of it in the, the days leading right up to Valentine's Day. And they had, like I said, the misfortune to source an ingredient from the Peanut Corporation of America. Now, <clears throat> what they did have was they had, they had tested the heck out of the peanut paste in their warehouse, and they did not find any salmonella in that peanut paste. Of course, uh, as you may know, um, just because you've tested a, an ingredient for the presence of pathogens doesn't mean that pathogens wouldn't be present. Um, 
in other samples of that same product that you that you did not test. The only way to be 100% sure that there's no pathogens in uh, a batch of product would be to sample the entire batch of product, at which point you have nothing left to sell and you've spent a whole lot of money doing testing. But they did they did do uh, quite a bit of testing, and so we're going to use that test those testing results in our calculations. Um, they had a thermal process for heating uh, this peanut uh, filling in the candy, um, but it wasn't a thermal process that was designed to control salmonella. It was a thermal process that was designed to cause this peanut filling to have certain flow characteristics so they could flow it into the molds to make the candy. So they weren't deliberately trying to kill salmonella with this particular uh, um, uh, process. They were just trying to achieve a certain um, uh, flowability. Now, it turns out that their process did have an effect on salmonella, but that wasn't the primary purpose of the process. Um, and they also didn't know uh, how salmonella would survive in this peanut paste after it was heated. Um, and again, we can make some guesses. We know that salmonella survives very well in a dehydrated state. That's why it's a problem in peanut um, uh, packing houses. It's why it's a problem in peanut butter. It's why it's a problem in many dried fruit and nut products in general. Salmonella survives very well uh, under a dehydrated condition, a low water activity condition. Uh, but this company didn't really have any knowledge about how their particular product uh, supported the survival of salmonella. We knew salmonella wouldn't grow um, because it was low water activity, but we didn't really have accurate data on how well it survived. So. Um, what did we have? Well, we had information on the formulation. We knew the serving size of the candy. We knew how much of this contaminated ingredient was in each serving, and we knew how much peanut butter was in was in that ingredient. Um, we we had a whole lot of test results, <clears throat> so we could calculate the probability <clears throat> that a given sample of peanut butter or peanut paste would be positive for salmonella, given uh, the number of tests that the company had already run. We had to, what we didn't know was we didn't know the concentration of salmonella in the contaminated ingredient. Now, uh, so what I did in this case was I got expert opinion. And, and I, so I called up a friend of mine who worked uh, for the Food and Drug Administration at the time, and I asked him, and I said, what is, what is FDA's best guess as to the concentration of salmonella in this product. And he gave me a number, and I use that number in my calculations. But it, it, is, it is only a guess. And if I use a different number, I would get different results. <clears throat> okay. So from that, I could calculate uh, the number of grams per serving, this number of salmonella cells per serving, the, uh, the and of course, if you do quantitative, if you do any kind of food microbiology, but especially quantitative risk assessment, you're always wanting to switch back and forth between um, uh, uh, arithmetic counts and log, logarithm counts, um, because the world of food microbiology deals in logarithms. <clears throat> so we could figure out the cells per serving. We could calculate the logarithm of the cells per serving. Um, we, we could estimate the log reduction. Um, we could calculate the uh, number of cells per serving after the thermal process, and then finally calculate the cells per serving that would be consumed by the consumers of this product. Now, um, <clears throat> how do you know whether someone is going to get sick from um, salmonella or not. Well, you use something called a dose response function, which is basically a probability, an equation that gives you a probability to say, okay, if I eat this many salmonella, what is the, pro the, the chance, the possibility that I'm going to get sick? And so I'll talk a little bit more about that dose response function and how we used it in our calculations in just a minute. So let's first talk about sampling. On the left-hand side, <clears throat> you see a plot of the probability in salmonella based on the known information that you've already tested five samples from that same batch, and none of those five samples are positive for salmonella. You can say <clears throat> almost definitively that the chance that another positive uh, the, the, the chance of another positive is um, certainly not as high as 60% or 80% or 100%. <clears throat> there's a small chance <clears throat> it's as high as 20%. Um, and there's an incredibly high chance that it might be 1% or 2%. And so what that basically says is that if you only, if you've tested 
five samples and you find no positives for salmonella, you really can't make very, a very definitive statement <clears throat> about the likelihood that salmonella is there at some very low uh, prevalence on the order of 1% or 2%. Now, what happens is if instead of testing five samples, you test 50 samples, now you can make a somewhat different statement. You know um, definitively that the chance of finding a salmonella positive is, is not 20%. In fact, it's not even 10%. You can say pretty definitively that the chance that the next sample that I take, um, uh, the chance of finding a positive is nowhere near 10%. But unfortunately, what you see is you still see that, uh, that red curve rising sharply uh, as the, the probability goes, as the, as the chance of, a, of the next sample being positive goes down. And so what we have to say here is that we still can't definitively say that the probability of a positive is zero. In fact, we can never say that. Um, what we can always say is that it's going to get closer and closer to zero the more samples we test. And again, this, is, this phenomenon is well known um, uh, in the food microbiology community. It's why we have HACCP, because HACCP uh, basically uses process control instead of statistical sampling to assure safety. Um, uh, Sampling is a lousy way to assure safety, but it does have some benefit. And, and again, these, these curves are meant to, to illustrate that. Now, uh, like I said, <clears throat> we knew that um, this company had a thermal process, but the thermal process was not terribly effective. We didn't, but what we did find is we, did, we knew that there was a paper um, published in the Journal of Food Protection in 2006 by a couple of uh, researchers from Israel. And those researchers did... Um, some experiments on the effect of heating on uh, inactivation of salmonella in peanut butter. And, and so what you can see here is the, the, uh, a graph reproduced from that paper. And based on that graph, um, we knew that the inactivation process for salmonella was likely nonlinear, uh, non so it's not a, a straight line um, uh, devalue calculation. It's a, curved, it's a curved line, and you can express that uh, using the equation that's shown there um, on the uh, on the uh, on the slide, um, and we didn't know anything about this company's thermal process. But basically, I said, well, if we don't know anything about your process, let's assume that it's somewhat similar to the process um, from this particular manuscript. These researchers studied uh, 70 degrees, 80 degrees, and 90 degrees C as processing temperatures. And so based on the information the company gave me, I came up with my best estimate as, uh, based on temperature and time as to what I thought the effectiveness of their process was in terms of log reduction. Now, here's the second key take-home message um, that, that I want you to take home from this. This is the dose response function uh, that I mentioned before. And this dose response function shows you the relationship between the concentration of bacteria, salmonella in this case, the concentration of salmonella that a, a normal healthy person would have to eat in order to become sick. And so what you can see, first of all, is that for very high doses of salmonella uh, on the order of um, uh, that would be uh, 100 million or uh, a billion salmonella, the probability that you're going to get sick is very, very close to one. And so, uh, for example, if I took everybody on the call here today and I had you drink a solution of a billion salmonella, um, uh, uh, you would, most of you, virtually all of you would, um, in 24 to 48 hours, not be very happy with me. Okay, and that's, that's normal. We, we know that salmonella makes people sick. But what we also know is that even very, very low levels have a chance of making someone sick. Now, you may hear um, microbiologists talk about something called the infectious dose. And the idea of the infectious dose is that if you eat, if you consume this number of a pathogen, you'll get sick. Well, I'm here to tell you that as a risk assessor and as a microbiologist, I believe there is no such concept as the infectious dose. So for example, if the infectious dose was 10 cells, that means that if you ate nine cells, you'd be sick. And if you ate, 10 cell, if you ate nine cells, you'd be, you wouldn't get sick. And if you ate 10 cells, you would get sick. And that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make biological sense to me. Um, and so 
again, it's my belief, and it's the belief of people that do quantitative risk assessment like I do, that even one cell can make you sick. But here's the thing. The chance of one cell making you sick is not the same as the chance of a million cells or a billion cells making you sick. So, for example, if we look on this particular plot, you can see that uh, about 10 to the fourth, okay, so that would be 10,000 cells. If I were to give everybody listening in on this call 10,000 cells of salmonella, if you believe this particular dose response function, um, then about 50% of you would be sick within 24 to 48 hours, and the other 50% of you would never get sick, maybe because those salmonella cells didn't survive the, uh, the pH of uh, the, uh, the, the acid in your stomach. Maybe those salmonella cells didn't find a place to in attach to the wall of your intestine. Uh, maybe um, they did attach, but your immune system fought them off and so that you, you never got a full-blown uh, diarrheal illness, okay? But again, the concept of the infectious dose is that even one cell can make you sick. Now, if you look at... Uh, a paper or a, a book actually that was published by the uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization in 2002, um, they wrote um, a detailed uh, document entitled Risk Assessments of Salmonella in Eggs and Broiler Chickens. And what they did um, in that uh, that that um, that that book, that 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 very extensive article, is they they proposed a dose response model for salmonella and it. In that dose response model, the probability that someone will become sick from eating one cell of salmonella was estimated to be 0.02%. Now, um, I, I have a little trouble um, uh, conceptualizing what 0.02% means, and so what I like to do is to take that probability and flip it upside down. And so another way of expressing 0.02% means that on average, if I feed one salmonella cell to 392 people, one of those people will become sick. And so if you, if you take away nothing else from this talk here today, take away this idea that there is, for, for many pathogens, I'm including salmonella and E. coli um, in this, okay, for many pathogens, even a single cell can make you sick. Now, there are other pathogens where we know this is not true, microorganisms like Clostridium perfringens or Bacillus cereus or even uh, staphylococcal food poisoning from Staphylococcus aureus toxin. We know that for those organisms, you have to get high levels of the, or of, of the organism uh, to have a chance of, of making someone sick. Not so with salmonella. So, um, and of course, if you, if you serve millions and millions of servings with a single salmonella cell, um, uh, those, out of those millions and millions of servings, you'll have hundreds of thousands of people getting sick because it, all it takes is um, uh, one cell to make one in every 392 people sick. So, for example, if I, if I, ga if I gave out um, uh, 4,000 servings, I would expect uh, on average to have 10 people sick. If I gave out 40,000 servings, I would expect a proportionally higher number of people to become sick, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, that's, a, that's a key concept to understand when, you, when you're trying to understand microbial risk assessment. Okay, so what were some of our assumptions? Well, we assumed that the peanut butter was contaminated at a low level, about one and a half cells per gram, and that was based on my conversations with my colleague at FDA. We knew that one serving of candy contains about 3.6 grams of peanut butter, so that means that uh, probably around uh, three cells of salmonella in that, uh, in that, um, uh, in that candy. Um, we knew that the company had 150 tests of peanut butter. They were all negative. And so remember, think back to those two plots with five and 50. Well, the 150 plot would look just the same, except that, um, that, that, um, uh, that peak rises even more sharply. But again, it's still not zero. We also knew that the company had, had Um, and so that's a lot of servings, even if they're contaminated at a very low level. Now, like I said, um, we knew that their thermal process was not designed to inactivate salmonella. And so we could, our best estimates were that the thermal process would give us somewhere of less than a one log reduction to about a one and a half log reduction. And so we made some assumptions and we put that into our calculations. 
we use the dose response um, um, uh, relationship that I just previously shared with you, and we ran um, that computer simulation 1. Uh, 1.5 million uh, servings, simul simulating the 1.5 million servings that they have on the marketplace. We ran that um, computer simulation 30 times, and so we had 30 different estimates of what the number of illnesses would be um, for that 1.5 million servings. And here's what we found. What we found was that we predicted from our calculations, we predicted that somewhere between about six and about 18 people would become sick if the company did not do a recall. And that we predicted on average, it would be around 12 people um, that, would, uh, that would become sick. Again, given that assumption of about a, a one to a one and a half log reduction. So I shared this information with the company and they, um, uh, they weren't happy. They were hoping that I would show that the, the risk was zero, uh, but of course the risk is never zero, and in this case the risk is significantly different from zero. And so um, what the company did was they actually went and they said, well, we think that some of your assumptions are wrong, and so we want to do additional uh, research, and we want to quantify the effectiveness of our actual thermal process. Remember what I said was we didn't know anything about their thermal process, and so we had to make some assumptions. Well, they went to the lab, back to the laboratory. Uh, they worked with a, with a colleague of mine, and they went to his laboratory, and they said, look, here's our thermal process. We want you to take some peanut paste. We want you to inoculate it with salmonella, and we want you to, to, to determine the effectiveness of the thermal process. And not only that, we want to study the ability of salmonella to survive in this, uh, in this peanut uh, paste filling. Because, again, remember, I had to assume that salmonella would survive if they didn't have any data on the effectiveness of uh, the, the effective time on, uh, on the survival of salmonella. And so uh, they went and they collected that information uh, in my colleague's laboratory. And then he shared those data with me, and I reran the simulation. And so when I – and there were two different processes uh, that this company assumed, and we'll call those process A and process B. Um, if they used process A – um, and then we, we simulated what would happen if people ate those 1.5 million servings after zero days. In other words, the, 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 all the customers are standing right uh, next door to the factory and they eat the candy right as it comes out of the factory, okay, versus if everybody ate it after seven days, after 21 days, and after 35 days. And what we showed through our calculations was that basically if process A was followed, we wouldn't expect anyone to become sick even if they ate all of the candy at time equals zero at zero days. They had another process that was a more mild process. And in this case, we, if we assume that everyone ate the candy at time zero, we would expect three illnesses on average. If they waited a week, we would expect one illness. And then, and then if it was uh, three weeks or, or four weeks, we would expect correspondingly fewer illnesses, basically down to zero illnesses. And so what this meant was since most of this product that the company was facing a recall had been on the market for well more than a week, they could safely conclude, or if, they, if, they, if you believe the results of my calculations, that the risk posed by this product was essentially zero and that they would not need to do a recall, um, uh, which was the news that they were hoping for. And so that was, uh, that was uh, how, we, how we ended that, um, uh, that project. So now remember, I want to come back to this idea of risk management. Remember that risk management is never going to be easy, okay? There is no such thing as zero risk, okay? The risk manager still ha at the company still had to decide what to do when I gave them the results of my risk assessment. And, and what the risk managers decided to do was they decided to go and, and study the problem some more and to get additional information on the survival of salmonella in this peanut paste. And so the risk assessment didn't tell them what to do. It told them what the risk was, and then they made a decision about what to do, and then they got more information. They got a new risk assessment, and then they made a decision that they were not going to do a recall uh, because they believed that the product posed risk. So um, hopefully I've, I've shown you how quantitative microbial risk assessment can be a valuable
Um, it's uh, obviously it's used by uh, government agencies around the world to make decisions, but it can also be used by food companies, even uh, small food companies like this one, um, to help them make decisions. And um, uh, part of the reason why I'm uh, giving talks like this one is I want to promote um, the idea that models and risk assessments can be useful for decision-making purposes. Okay, so that, that ends my uh, first case study. Now I'm going to turn to a different product and a different study. Now this is a paper. It was published in 2011 in the Journal of Food Protection um, on leafy greens. And I'm, I'm not going to go um, into as much detail as the paper because you can just go read the paper if you want more, but I want to uh, uh, share with you what I think are some of the important, um, uh, important aspects from the paper. So we know um, from following the news that the microbial safety of fresh produce is increasingly important. Uh, people should eat more fresh produce because it's a healthy choice, uh, but we want them to do it um, by eating food that is, that is uh, as safe as possible. We had major multi-state outbreaks in the fall of 2006, uh, and these outbreaks were attributed to E. coli 15787 from spinach, and then there were some other outbreaks linked to shredded lettuce. What we wanted to do was to take all of the relevant published data to integrate that data into a quantitative risk assessment and then strive to recreate the 2006 spinach outbreak. So we did a literature search, and then based on what we found in the literature, we built computer models. Um, aspects of the, the paper that, are, that I think are, are unique and are especially interesting are we studied the effect of washing the spinach. We also studied the effect of cross-contamination. Um, one of the things that was uh, believed to have occurred in this particular outbreak is that the company that was uh, uh, washing the spinach um, was believed to have not had good control of uh, chlorination uh, in the uh, in in, in the, the, um, uh, the 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 wash process, and so because they didn't have good control of chlorination, what that meant was that. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a possibility of cross-contamination, that is microorganisms spreading from um, one leaf to another leaf. Uh, we had uh, uh, made our best guesses as to time and temperature during retail and home storage, because we know that, that uh, products like this may support the growth of microorganisms, especially if the leaves are damaged or cut in any way. We built our own uh, microbial growth model based on the published literature of the time. We had some information on the probability of salmonella, um, or of E. coli rather, being in the recalled spinach. And so we used that data as kind of an anchor point for our risk assessment. And I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. We used a dose response model, different one than, than the salmonella one, but a dose response model with the same shape nonetheless. And again, just like we did with the peanut butter, uh, peanut paste example, we used uh, simulation modeling. We used um, some software called At Risk, which does uh, Monte Carlo modeling. And in this particular case, we ran um, 100,000 iterations of the simulation uh, and got uh, some various results, which I will share with you. OK. Um, <clears throat> the risk assessment uh, is relatively complicated. It starts in the field. Uh, we had no real information on the prevalence and concentration of uh, E. coli in the field, and so we had to make some assumptions. Uh, we knew that E. coli in the field would decline over time, um, and so there was a certain effect of just sitting out in the field and, and of uh, ultraviolet rays of sunlight um, shining down on these lettuce leaves, and so there was, that was accounted for. Um, uh, we calculated the effect of washing, and then also we calculated the effect of cross-contamination. Now, it turns out that uh, cross-contamination modeling was a little bit harder. Um, uh, we, could, we could do a calculation for the log reduction on the spinach leaves directly with only uh, basically three lines of computer code, um, but figuring out cross-contamination actually took 10 lines of computer code, so it was a little bit more complicated. We studied the effect of temperature at retail and at home. Um, we had uh, actually a lot more data on uh, home storage, and so uh, we made that part of the model more complicated. Um, we had an idea of the number of servings on the marketplace. We used a do published dose response model, and then we calculated the number of illnesses, and we ran some uh, calculations.
your uh, growth model, and what you can see is that we use data from seven different studies. Those seven different studies are represented by the different shapes, and we looked at the effect of uh, temperature on the growth of the organism um, at, uh, at different temperatures, and, uh, and that's the computer model that we came up with. Um, there's some scatter there. There's some data at 30 degrees that we, uh, that we ignored in making the model because we felt it wasn't relevant, um, uh, and that's, that's the model that we used. It turns out um, that, that actually subsequent computer models predict a lot more growth than this particular model. Um, but at the time, there were, no, were, there were no other published models, and so we, we, we did the best that we could, and this is the model that we came up with. Um, this shows uh, a, a table from the manuscript, and this is kind of a, like a key take-home message. And so what you can see here is that um, – let me see. No, I thought I had some animations on there, but I don't. Um, so what this showed was the – Different assumptions in the in the in the uh, in the risk assessment. Okay, um, the fraction of product that was positive coming out of the field, we allow that number. And this are these are completely not arbitrary, but these are numbers that are just our own best guesses, right? They're not they're not based on anything. But we 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 use different assumptions. Like let's assume that one percent of all the servings coming out of the field are contaminated. Uh, let's assume that only 0.1% are contaminated. Let's assume that 0.01% are contaminated. And then we also made assumptions about the concentration of microorganisms on the product. And again, these are low prevalence and low concentrations. And so the concentration might be um, one cell per gram or one cell per 10 grams or even one cell per 100 grams. Okay? And so based on that, we ran our computer simulation. The, the simulation predicts a number of illnesses. Um, and then because we are, have visibility into all aspects of, of the simulation, we could calculate the actual number of illnesses that arose because a particular piece of spinach was cross-contaminated during the washing process. Of course, in the real world, we would never know that. But because this is a computer simulation, we could know lots of things that we wouldn't ever know in the real world. Um, now, the other thing to keep in mind, if we're trying to simulate um, an, an outbreak that happened in the real world, is we have to uh, understand um, the importance of under-reporting. And, and under-reporting is something that uh, FDA, uh, rather the CDC, knows exists. And so if you ever read any public health um, disease statistics, you'll see that there is um, often um, a factor by which you can adjust your calculations um, to calculate the number of people that actually will um, report um, a particular outbreak. And so if we want to simulate this 2006 spinach outbreak, we need to consider that underreporting factor. And so that's what um, that last line uh, uh, in that table does. And so that last line starts uh, with the number uh, 418, and it goes all the way uh, over to 77. And so this is the mean number of illnesses that would be reported for an outbreak um, uh, the size of, of this particular outbreak. And so uh, that leads to a, and that number basically is 21 times lower than the actual, um, the actual number of people that, that were sick. And so I think in the actual outbreak, 199 people were sick. And so what you can see is that bottom line that goes from 77 up to 418, that's pretty much in that range of 199. And so, so if you believe the results of our calculations, what this says basically is that this outbreak happened due to low concentrations on the product and uh, a relatively small fraction of uh, incoming product that was, uh, that was positive. And that could have easily produced an outbreak of the size that we see, that we see here. Um, the most important point, though, is the second uh, – the most important point to me right now is the second uh, line from the bottom, which is the fraction of illnesses due to cross-contaminated pieces. And what you can see here is that basically almost all of the cases, almost all of the people that got sick got sick not because they ate a piece of spinach that came out of the field contaminated, but they ate a piece of spinach 
that wasn't contaminated when it came out of the field, but then got cross-contaminated during the washing process, which again is consistent with this idea of lack of adequate chlorine leading to the outbreak. And so virtually all of the cases, more than 95% of them, in some cases close to 100% of them, resulted um, because someone ate a piece of spinach that was not originally contaminated, but then had contamination that was spread to it. Okay. Um, uh, this basically uh, shows the the uh, the the uh, when someone gets sick, what's the likely dose that they ate, and what you, and again without going into too much detail because I think we're a little bit short on time, and I want to be sure to save plenty of time for questions. Basically, what this says is that most people that got sick got sick from, from eating a very, very low dose of the organism. And so um, minus one log CFU per gram, that's one cell in every 10 grams. And so in the, in the simulation, 25% of the people got sick from eating only one cell in 100, or, or sorry, one cell in 10 grams. So that's a, again, a typical spinach serving is something like 80, uh, 80 grams. And so uh, that's a very, very small serving size, a very small number of of, of cells. Of course, some people ate very high doses, but most people ate very, very low doses. And that turns out that that number is also consistent with our estimates of the most probable number um, uh, of, 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 of E. coli cells that were recovered from product that was linked to the outbreak. And so it, it, it's a good double check. And so the, again, the key, the key take home message here is that low doses coupled with many, many servings, can still lead to many illnesses. Again, why? Because of that dose-response relationship that I talked about before, where the, uh, uh, even a small number of cells uh, will, uh, even a single cell has a, a, a probability of causing illness of somewhere in 1 in 200 to 1 in 400, depending upon the pathogen and the, and the, uh, the system. Okay. Uh, so where does this leave us in terms of this particular study? Well, uh, it certainly leaves us with uh, critical data gaps remaining. We had to uh, use a lot of expert opinion to do this particular risk assessment. Um, also, what we learned was uh, subsequently, we, we've learned through some additional research, is that our, our growth model actually uh, estimates significantly fewer um, uh, uh, significantly less growth as a result of changes in temperature. More recent models are actually more liberal and predict more growth, but even even with our low, um, uh, even with our low um, growth rate, we still got significant illnesses. Um, a key finding from our work was that a majority of the simulated cases arose from cross-contamination, and that's um, uh, a triggered, uh, in part, um, uh, a lot of research with people trying to improve models for cross-contamination, and, and our lab has been part of that as well. Um, so uh, the good news is that there is additional research coming um, from, from us and from others that's being published all the time, uh, quantifying the effect of cross-contamination. Um, yeah, so, and the good news is, again, we, we think we have a pretty good match. The, the levels that we predicted in the model match our best estimates of the, the number of uh, pathogens that were found in actual product, and so that gives us a, a satisfaction that we think our model is, is pretty accurate. So, um, where does that leave us? Well, um, I want to just briefly summarize before we open it up for questions um, that uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment has been used by regulatory agencies for quite some time. Um, it's increasingly being used by um, um, large companies, but even uh, with a little bit of help from somebody like me, even the small company can, can um, benefit from um, calculations that are, that are done to help them manage risk. Um, often, uh, scientists uh, feel paralyzed because they never have enough data to, to do the calculations that they want. Uh, I think good risk assessors are not afraid of that. Uh, we're not afraid to make assumptions, and then uh, if those assumptions later turn out to be wrong, uh, we can correct the models. Uh, but I think you should never um, shy away from making a model, uh, even if you have to make some assumptions, because if you, at least if you, by virtue of creating the model, you do learn um, uh, what maybe some important data gaps are. Uh, as I said before, and I'll reiterate it again, um, um, many, many servings coupled with a low dose will lead to um, some level of illness, and so there is no such thing 
which leads to the next bullet point. There's no such thing as zero risk, and there's no such thing as an infectious bestow. of that illness is very low. You can think of it like buying a lottery ticket, um, except this is a lottery that nobody wants to win. If you buy one lottery ticket, you have a certain chance of winning. But if you buy a million lottery tickets, uh, like you just eating a million salmonella, uh, you've got a much higher chance of, uh, of, of getting sick or of, of winning that, that terrible lottery. Um, um, and then finally, uh, hopefully this uh, uh, approach of using data can help risk managers make better and, and more informed decisions. Um, with that, I want to leave you with a couple of places where you can go for more information. Um, the Society for Risk Analysis uh, meets every year in the United States. It's a great meeting for people that are interested in quantifying risk across a wide array of different um, um, situations, uh, including a small but dedicated group of people that focus on food safety and microbial risk. But uh, the Society for Risk Analysis deals with risk um, very, very broadly and focuses on risk uh, assessment, risk management, and risk communication. Uh, there's the International Association for Food Protection. Uh, the, the, the SRA meeting is, is uh, in December every year. The IAFP meeting um, is um, uh, in the summer every year. This, this summer it's, it's going to be in Salt Lake City, and so uh, it's a great meeting for food safety, and it's also a, a good meeting if you want to learn more about quantitative microbial risk assessment. Uh, finally, there's the International Conference on Predictive Modeling in Foods. Uh, this particular conference is held every two years. It was just held uh, last September in Cordoba, Spain, um, and it's going to be held um, uh, in uh, uh, 2020 in Portugal. And so uh, look for more information about that coming soon. Um, of course, you can read scientific journals like the Journal of Food Protection uh, that I mentioned, the risk journal called Risk Analysis. There's a new one coming out uh, called Microbial Risk Analysis. We have a manuscript that we're currently working on uh, for norovirus in, in frozen berries that we're going to be submitting to that journal very soon. And then finally, I just want to take a, a brief minute to promote um, uh, a podcast that I do. Uh, it's entitled Food Safety Talk. You can find it in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, uh, and you can find us on the web at foodsafetytalk.com. Uh, in this particular uh, podcast, I meet every couple of weeks uh, uh, on the phone and talk with my colleague, uh, Ben Chapman, um, uh, and we talk about risk assessment, risk management, risk communication, and, and all things related to, to food safety. So um, with that, uh, that concludes my formal remarks, and I'd be happy to try to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Schaffner, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, the question and answer portion is now open, so remember to turn on your microphone if you want to ask the question directly to our speaker, or uh, you can write it down on the chat and I will read it up out loud for him. I had a couple of sure. questions um, in, in the chat, but I'm not sure whether the people that wrote them want me to read them or, or not. They didn't say anything. So please. Um... Yeah, well, I, okay. I, I see one question so... that was sent to me privately. So, um, oh. Yeah. I'm, I'm... Okay. So let, the let first me, question me... that I got it says. Okay, the question that you got sent, it was sent it to me as well. So okay. I, can, I, I will read them. Um, the first question is from um, Antonio Torres, and he asks, in the case of a peanut, in the case of peanut, did you study the survival of salmonella? Otherwise, I don't understand the effect of time on the number of cases in process B. Right. And so in the original calculations that I did for the company, I assumed that basically the population of salmonella was stable in uh, in the product. And so uh, no matter how long you stored it, this, the level of salmonella was, was constant. Now, there, is, there are some data that show uh, sur uh, change in survival depending upon storage temperature, but, I, but in an effort to be simple and conservative, I, I excluded that. 
in the in the case of the process B that you're talking about, yes, one of the things that my colleague did when so he he did two things for the for the company. The first thing he did was he quantified the effectiveness of their thermal process, and then second. He took product that had been processed according to their thermal process and stored it and then sampled it over time. And so basically the data that he had that went into my calculations for process B was on the survival of salmonella in the, the actual product that, that that company manufactured. And so we, did, we didn't use it in the initial calculations, but we did use it in subsequent calculations, which is why that number goes down. Uh, from three to one to essentially zero, because salmonella is is not surviving. It's dying, not rapidly, but it's dying in that product. not getting your audio wrong. Sorry. Um, now, I have another question here. Yeah, yeah. I, I realize now. Um, in the case of the spinach, um, and it's, again, a question from Antonio Torres, uh, does, it mean, does it mean that the veggies should not have been washed? That's a really good question. Because you mentioned something about cross Cross contamination. That's a really good question. If they, and it's complicated, right? If they hadn't washed the, the spinach, the outbreak would have been much smaller. But also, if they hadn't washed the spinach, that product might have been rejected by their customers because it was dirty. So um, what they really should have done is they should have washed the spinach, but they should have more closely monitored the sanitizer level in the wash water because if you have adequate sanitizer in the wash water, that is essentially prevents cross-contamination, right? And so, so, yes, not washing would have been good, uh, but putting chlorine in the wash water to prevent cross-contamination uh, probably would have been better because that way they, they had a product that looked good that they could also sell. Thank you. And now the final question that I got here. Um, so Claudia asks if, uh, how do you did the dose response modeling? Did you use a mice or, well, did you use it in mice or, um, which kind of species? Right, and so first of all, I would clarify that we did not do any dose response modeling, right? We, did, or we didn't do any dose response experiments. Uh, all of the experiments that went into the, the two dose response models that we used, those experiments were done by other people. And, and, this, and, and I thank you for the question, Claudia, because this uh, points out a significant limitation of, uh, of this kind of work. When you're doing chemical risk assessment, Often you do dose response modeling using animal species and then you add a uh, hundred fold safety factor. When you're doing microbial dose response uh, work, you really can't do that. And so what you have to actually do is you have to actually feed pathogens to people. Now, uh, that these experiments are very expensive. Um, many of them today can't be done for ethical reasons. And so a lot of the dose response data that we have that goes into the models we use today, those data were collected um, in the last century when we had less restrictions about human subject research. And so, um, so uh, the, but typically those data are not done with animals, they are done with humans, um, but they're, you know, again, many of them were, were done uh, with people that were in prison, incarcerated, and so again, today, those studies just wouldn't pass ethical review and so we can't do them. We still have the data and we, we use that data as best we can. Now one thing we can do that's kind of interesting is if we have an existing dose response model and then we have an actual food poisoning outbreak and we can estimate the, the contamination level in the servings that were served to people and we know that level and we know the fraction of people that ate that, that level of, of pathogen, did and did not get sick, 
that can sometimes help us to anchor our dose response curve and, and put it um, uh, to basically to correct or to, to adjust for um, you know, virulence of the organism and things like that. But the bottom line is we have to, we can we can use we can. complicated than in chemical risk assessment where you can use animals um, because the mechanisms of cancer and, and things like that are similar. With, with infection, it's not nearly so easy. Um, but the good news is, is that we have data and we do the best that we can. We, we realize that's a limitation of the approach. And again, uh, we never try to let, uh, let that uh, limitation prevent us from doing calculations because even if, you're, even if your dose response model is wrong, at least it gives you some idea of the answer and then the, the, the directionality. If you, can, if you make changes that cause the number of illnesses to go down, even if your actual number, exact number of illnesses is not completely correct, as long as you can tell whether you're making the illnesses go up or down, that can be still a useful way to, to manage risk. But it's, it's a good, it's, it's a really good question, and I thank you for it, Claudia. Okay, we have more questions. Um, Rosy Bueno um, asked, What's the best way to go about selecting prevalence values or initial concentration when setting models in at risk assessment or, or model in risk? Yeah, so 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 sure. yeah, it's a it's a good question, uh, and I'll just point out the two ways that we did it, right? And so um, with the uh, in in the peanut example, uh, I asked experts from the FDA about concentration and prevalence was set based on the sampling results that the company had. And so we knew that the prevalence had to be less than a certain value. The other thing that we did in the Leafy Greens one is we just simply assumed a range of prevalence values and a range of concentration values that we thought were likely, and we ran the model with those. And so, um, but often we don't have that information, and so we just have to, to, to make assumptions. And then that, those assumptions just become one additional thing that you consider in your scenario analysis for the model. And I see that there's one more uh, question that's come into me via the chat, and so I'll just answer that. Um, and that says the FAO model uh, okay. assumes people are healthy, but in many low moisture food outbreaks, uh, there are sensitive sense, uh, sectors of the population, elderly and kids. Could that affect the results, and how do you account for that? It's a really good question. Um, and essentially, the, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It can affect the results. And often what we'll do is we'll just have a uh, sensitivity factor where we just basically amplify uh, the model. We make the, the, the population tenfold more sensitive or a hundredfold more sensitive. Um, but, but there really is no good way. Of course, you can't do, I mean, we, we know with listeria, we're really interested in pregnant women and neonates. Well, we're never going to do a dose response model um, or no, dose response study with that population. And so we've got to figure out surrogates. But if we, if we can do some animal studies that give us an indication of maybe the, the order of magnitude effects, we can take human data and then, and then adjust it. But, but ultimately, it, it ends up being an assumption. So that, it, that is a limitation, again, but the, the, the alternative is you end up not doing anything. And so, again, you know, you, you, you do the best you can based on the, the available literature and you make, you make estimates. And then if, if somebody wants to question those estimates or question those assumptions, you can run those as different alternatives and scenarios in your model. But, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question, and I don't have a really good answer except to say we do the best we can. Okay. Pratap uh, asks, when when you did the regression of the growth curve from the literature data, I noticed you left out a high slope point at the end. Um, it was showing three log growth or something, uh, whereas your regression equations predicts only 2.5 log growth. Uh, shouldn't we always assume the worst case scenario? Um, well, the problem, you know, no, you shouldn't always assume the worst case scenario. Um, 
because the worst case scenario may not occur um, except for you know some amount of time. Um, I think this is the the figure that you're referring to, and uh, in particular, the reason why we chose to exclude this particular study is uh, that, that that study used a food product, uh, cord iceberg lettuce, that was significantly different than the other data. And so what we ended up doing was excluding that. Now, it turns out other people have come along and have uh, created new growth models that show that our growth model underestimates. And that's okay, right? I mean, we did the best we could with the data that we had, and we made some assumptions. We justified those assumptions, and we used them in our calculations. Um, but no, you have to be very, very careful about always choosing worst case, because if you, choose, if you always choose worst case, then nothing is safe, and we would not have any food left to eat because there would always be some risk. And so you, you do have to be careful about what's called compounding conservatism, where you put worst case on top of worst case on top of worst case, and in that case, again, like I said, nothing is nothing is safe, and that's 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 not a helpful situation. And so you have to you have to consider the worst case, but only the the degree of the time that that worst case actually occurs. In my opinion. Okay, so we have a, another question from Dr. Uh, Antonio Torres, but I'm not sure uh, because I'm getting it at different orders. So I'm not sure at which part of the talk he's referring. So do you correct the information for the unreporting fraction? And I think he was, uh, I, I'm guessing this was related to the outbreaks, but I'm not sure. Yeah, and so uh, I think what he's talking about is is this uh, underreporting fraction. And so what you can see here is that the if you take uh, the the top line, which is the mean total illnesses, and you divide that number by 21, you get the mean total illnesses reported. Okay, because that's that 21 uh, underreporting factor. And so it depends what you're trying to do. If if what you're trying to do is to simulate an outbreak that's occurred in the real world, and what you know are the reported cases. You need to have that. Um, when I did the when I did the work with the peanut butter company, um, I did not do that. I did so if if I factored in underreporting, this would have this particular figure would have told them, hey, you're not going to get any reported outbreak, reported cases, which was the which which was a the wrong decision to send to them. And so what I said was, this is the number of people that I think will actually become sick from eating your product. Um, uh, and so you, you, you know, you should. I think you should. Do, I, mean, I didn't say this, but but obviously, you know, uh, 12 people sick is is too many, and they needed to do something about that. So, it, but it depends upon what you're trying to do. Are you just making a pure prediction, or are you trying to simulate an, uh, something that happened already? Um, but the main thing is to realize that that underreporting exists, and and it should be attended to. Again, um, thank you for the answer. And Anub, Anubai uh, has another question. Um, he's asking when you when you model for first. Um, I'm guessing when your first model predicted that the product must be recalled, shouldn't they? I'm referring to the company. Have been recalled by the company. Well, that's a risk management. The product decision. have been recalled by the company. Yeah, that's a risk management decision, right? So it's up to the managers in the company to decide what to do. And what they decided to do was to wait and to collect more data. Um, and that's, you know, there's no, there's, there's, no, there's no science that will tell you the right thing to do, right? Because risk managers have to deal with the fact that, like, what, I mean, if they did a recall, maybe the company would have gone out of business and all those people would have lost their jobs. Um, and, and, you know, and so that's what they were facing. And so there is no, there's no right answer. There's no easy answer. Um, they made a decision to not do a recall and to go and, and do some more experiments. Um, and in the end, it turns out that that was the right decision because uh, then uh, they showed that, in fact, they didn't need to do a recall. But you're absolutely right. Um, 
uh, they could have reacted and done a recall um, uh, in the first case, um, in which case they would have spent money they didn't need to spend because it turned out they didn't need a recall. So again, there's not there's no easy answers here, and, and no amount of science is going to help you um, with making a decision. Ultimately, you have to make the decision that you, that you think is right, um, and, uh, you know, that's life. So I see a question. EC does not have the power to order recalls. Um, uh, FDA has some ability to compel a company to do a recall, but it's not absolute. Um, and I would say that uh, in this case, FDA never would have done this particular calculation for the company because FDA doesn't see that as their job. Um, when I'm, whenever I'm doing work like this for a company, I'm always writing it as if I imagine that FDA is reading it, and I try to write it in a way that's defensible that would be that would be believed by my colleagues at FDA, um, but but I don't think FDA uh, is ever going to get in the business of doing uh, risk assessments for companies because that's the job of consultants, um, uh, and it's up to FDA to, to to stay above the fray. Now FDA might do a risk assessment across a commodity or across a like they might do a, a risk assessment for leafy greens in the United States, but that's different than doing a, a particular assignment for a particular company. Does anyone else have Does anyone else have uh, a question? Otherwise, uh, I don't have any more questions on the chat. No, nope, I don't see any either on my end. Okay. Well, it seems that nobody else has questions. So, thank you, Dr. Sh Dr. Schaffner, for this interesting talk, and thank you all for participating on it. Um, Next month, our speaker will be Dr. Jorge Manuel Alexandre Saraiva from University of Aveiro, Portugal. Uh, keep turn and check our website for our Facebook page for more information. Thank you again. Thanks for the opportunity. Dr. Schaffner. You're welcome. My pleasure. This concludes our webinar. So. Um, see you next time.